Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsheim. Hi, everyone. Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Glad you could join us for our conversation this week. We're going to be talking with Joel Trammell. Joel is a CEO. He's an entrepreneur, has grown companies from a startup to a successful nine-figure exit. Uh, He has written for a magazine such as Entrepreneur, uh, Inc. Magazine, and he wrote a book called CEO Tightrope. He runs a company, a software company now called Chorus Software, which provides uh, software to help CEOs uh, improve in performance within the organizations in alignment and uh, is also involved with the American CEO, which he provides mentorship uh, and coaching to, to CEOs. Looking forward to our conversation with Joel. Joel, can you first off just give us a little bit of your your background, your career? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I uh, started my career in the United States Navy uh, right out of college, teaching at what they call Naval Nuclear Power School, and uh, thought about going back and getting an MBA. I had an engineering degree, and uh, but at that time, they wanted 60 hours of undergraduate uh, business before they'd let you in the MBA program. And so I just decided to start my first business instead. And so uh, unfortunately, I became unqualified to do anything else. And you got to figure out a way to make it work. And so for the last 30 years, almost, I've been running businesses of one type or another. I was fortunate to have a couple of uh, fairly successful outcomes with some software companies that we grew from zero to nine-figure exits. And uh, so I've spent the last uh, six or eight years really focused on the role of the CEO and training CEOs, teaching a course, writing a book called The CEO Tightrope, and now having software for CEOs. Great. Well, I ask this question of uh, every CEO I I bring on, and knowing what you know now, uh, any advice you would, if you could go back and and talk to a 22-year-old Joel, what would you tell him? Yeah, so the 22-year-old Joel was a typical engineer, thought that everything was in the numbers, that in the analytics, being smart in math had some great superpower value in the world. Uh, And I would tell him that, you know, all that stuff's great, but it's really all about people. And uh, business is all about people. And you might want to go back and study some more stuff on the people side of the equation, develop a language for talking about people, understanding people, working with people. Uh, cause that's what was going to make a difference in your career. Right. So you, you talked about that you're now, uh, helping train new CEOs. Tell us a little bit about that and, and what, uh, uh, what that's all about. Yeah. So the, the job is unique, uh, in the business world, uh, in that it's very multifunctional and, and most of us start our careers and, you know, we're trained as an engineer or an accountant or a, or we, we get into sales or whatever, and we spend a large part of our career often. Uh, getting expertise in that area. And uh, so that when you're the VP of sales, for instance, and a problem comes to your desk, you're the best guy to figure out the answer. You've seen something similar, if not the exact same problem before. So you can analyze the data, you understand the problem, you make a decision. Uh, But this CEO role is very different. It's multifunctional, right, across every area. So you, you know, take a sales guy and make him CEO, and suddenly nine out of the 10 problems that come to their desk aren't sales problems and they can't, they don't have time to become the expert on how to do a building lease or who to, how to hire people and set HR policy or what the gap recognition rules should be for their particular business. Right. And so it's really a process of learning how to leverage other people uh, from an expertise perspective. And, and that's a transition that a lot of people struggle with because they've been very successful in their career. You don't get to the CEO role typically, unless you've been very successful doing what you're doing, but it's typically been by being an expert. And now you have to be that cha- switch gears and switch hats. And it's like playing a different sport. It, it It's different. And uh, mm-hmm. you, you kind of become a generalist instead of a specialist. And you, you're much more about leveraging talent in the organization. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen new CEOs make as they're moving maybe from, from a functional role, maybe they're the head of sales and all of a sudden they're in the CEO's uh, seat? Uh, what, what have you seen? Yeah, I think a lot of, they, they think they can understand everything. They can get into the details of everything. They can keep track of what everybody's working on. Um, 
and, and they maybe could in a sales role, even a very big sales role, because it was all about deals and, and they could maybe keep track of 100 deals and kind of in their head at one time, right? But because of this multifunctional uh, relationship of the job, you, you really can't be involved in the da data uh, flowing out of the business. There's just too much to master all that. And, and so I see a lot of CEOs really struggle. They think they just need to work harder. They need to spend more time. Uh, but they're really chasing the wrong, the wrong area. So when, when somebody has moved from, uh, from a functional area into that CEO seat, um, what, what advice do you give them kind of that first 90 days uh, in, the, in the role or that first year? What, uh, what do you tell them? Yeah, it, it's, again, it's unique because when you take another role, let's say, you know, when, the, when you became VP of sales, maybe a new company hires you, so you go into the company and, and kind of the traditional best practice is, well, don't mess anything up, right? I'm just here to learn. I'm just here to absorb. Uh, and you, if you go into the CEO role and you take that approach, what you don't realize is you're the captain of the ship. The captain of the ship has to steer the ship. The captain of the ship doesn't have 90 days to figure out where he's going. <laughs> right. he, he's expected to steer the ship. And so I see a lot of CEOs. And, and so the, the first advice I give them, is figure out where you're going. You may not know where you're going five years from now. You may not have the perfect vision in place yet, but you were brought on to go somewhere and you need to communicate that very quickly because everybody's waiting around just like you walked on the deck of a boat. You wouldn't say, well, I'm not sure where we're, just sail, you know, just <laughs> sail out there. So, no, you'd say, here's where we're going, right? And so it, it's very important to realize when you take over as CEO, people are expecting that kind of leadership day one. And, and you've got to jump into it, even though at the same time, you know, you don't have all the answers. Yes, you need to listen to everybody in the organization. You need to figure it out, but you still are captain day one. So working, what advice would you give a new CEO that uh, maybe the first time that they've worked with a board? Uh, tell me a little bit about that and, and just some, some advice you would give somebody that's uh, moving into that, uh, that seat. Yeah, boards are uh, a very interesting uh, conundrum for a lot of CEOs because uh, boards, you know, work as a collaborative group. Uh, and uh, so they, they make decisions very differently than any individual on that board might make the decision. And so uh, you have to understand they're, they're very risk averse, obviously. They don't like being surprised. Uh, and so you got to be very careful. The board typically also really only knows what you tell them, uh, at least you know, 80% of their information is coming from what you tell them. And I find CEOs often tell them the wrong things. They tell them, they give them way too much detail and act like they expect the board to do the analysis and figure out the answer instead of what they really should be giving boards is, hey, I've done the analysis. Here are a couple of different directions we could go. Here are the trade-offs. Choose A or B. Uh, that, that's, that's what boards are really looking for. Too many CEOs want to show all the work they've done. And then the board, they basically put the board in the position of reanalyzing their work, getting into minute details that don't really matter. And you got to understand your board probably only thinks about your business one or two days every quarter. Uh, you're in the middle of it. So you can, right. you can live in that detail and be aware of what's going on and, and analyze things at a much greater level. You have to bring it up a level or two, abstract, the, get to the core concepts and let the board make those major strategic direction uh, help you make those, but keep them out of the weeds. So when you moved into that first, go back to that first CEO role that you had, um, did you have mentors that were around you that that helped you figure it out? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so so you know, I kind of got into it the uh, old fashioned way of, of of just starting my own business, uh, running my own business out of my own pocket. Uh, and so, you know, all the mistake, I didn't have a board at that point, of course, I just, all the mistakes I made were, were my fault, uh, and, and cost me in the pocketbook. Uh, and so I did that for, for many years before I actually, uh, raised venture money for a business and, and then had a, you know, a formal board and, and really set up a company. So I came into that experience knowing uh, a fair amount about running a business and, and I could depend on the board for strategic advice, but I didn't need them for tactical 
kind of day to day, uh, you know, how, what to do, how to run the business, how to hire people, how to, you know, sell a product, how to market a product, those kind of basic questions I didn't have to depend on the board for. So when you moved into that uh, stage where you were having to raise some funds, uh, what do you wish you would have known uh, uh, prior to doing that? How hard it is to raise funds. Uh, I got lucky, uh, incredibly lucky. The first uh, firm we ever pitched with my first business, uh, we raised $11 million. Uh, I have since then pitched 100, literally done more than 100 pitches to VC firms and raised zero dollars. Uh, and most people consider me pretty successful in my career. <laughs> and so 1% uh, kind of average, batting average, uh, it's really hard to raise money. Uh, you know, people say, oh, well, if you've had a success, then they'll just throw money at you. No, that doesn't happen. You can have multiple successes and they still won't throw money at you. Uh, so raising money is really hard. And and raising, you got to raise money for the right reason. Uh, a, a lot of people seem to think that the goal is to raise money. The goal is not to raise money. The goal is to build a great business that has value. Sometimes raising money is the best and quickest path to doing that. But for a lot of businesses, it's not. And uh, money doesn't, you know, doesn't really help the equation. So I think uh, I've heard that uh, almost everybody in the United States wants to write a book, but only 1% ever will. Right. <laughs> you, and you've, you've been through that experience of writing a book. Tell me a little bit about that experience and just uh, also maybe just a little bit of an overview of, of what you talk about. Yeah, so it started as, as uh, teaching a course. And so my first job out of college, as I said, was teaching at Naval Nuclear Power School. So I had the teaching background. And so when I first started teaching the course, uh, I kind of knew how to structure the course. And of course, every time you teach the course, it gets a little better. It gets a little more structured. You get a little more material. And so then after about five years of teaching the course, I, I, could, I could say, okay, now I'm going to write a book. And I had a lot of the basics, you know, structure and, and thought process already down. So that made it easier. Uh, second, I got a great editor. Uh, somebody who would read everything I wrote and, uh, you know, ask questions and tell me what didn't make sense and, and, and have ideas uh, to how to explain things better. And so that was critically important uh, to the process. And then, and then it is a lot of hard work. I mean, I, would, uh, I bought actually a, a seatbelt contraption. Uh, I think it was a luggage uh, band that you put around a, a large set of luggage to hold it together, but I used it as a seatbelt. And I would walk into my office at 8 a.m. in the morning and pretend I was on a flight for the next hour. And then I couldn't get up and go to the kitchen and I couldn't go do this and I couldn't go do the laundry or whatever. It seemed more appealing than writing another damn line in the book. Uh, and so for an hour, I would write. And, uh, you know, you do that for about 100 days and you've you've probably got 80 percent of a book. Mm. Wow. That's that's a great uh Great way to do it. I, I've never heard anybody say that. So that's uh, everybody's going to start buying. Y'all have to start selling some of those for <laughs> the yeah. side. So tell us a little bit about the book. Just some of the, just a quick overview. Yeah, the, what I wanted to do, and and you know, again, my engineering background probably leads me to think about things more systematically than some might. And uh, what I was always looking for was the, how do you think about the CEO role systematically? And because you need to do, if you want to train somebody to be a CEO, you, you got to give them some sort of system to anchor around, right? You can't just give them a bunch of anecdotal stories about how brilliant you were and, 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 make, and that just doesn't really work. And so uh, I started the book. I thought there might be other systems. I thought maybe Harvard or Stanford or, you know, business school might have a system for being CEO. And so I tried to find them and I couldn't find anything. So, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to build the best system for being CEO because it's the only one I know of. And that's, that's the purpose of the book is to lay out what really should a CEO with hundreds of employees, what is really the job? Because the CEO is unique in that they get to go and decide what they're going to do every day. They don't have a boss sitting there in the next office telling them, oh, can you do this? Can you do that? What about this? What about that? They do pretty much what they want on a given day. But what should you be doing? What is the thing? What are the things that only the CEO can do for the organization? And that's what we try to talk about in the book. Right. 
So you can get that, pick that up on Amazon or where? Yeah, absolutely. You, you can pick it up on Amazon in uh, Kindle or uh, hard copy or Audible. And the guy who read it for Audible did a really nice job. So I've, I've had a lot of comments that people really enjoyed the Audible version. And then uh, if you want a signed copy, you can go to theamericanceo.com. And that's my uh, personal website. And I'll send you a signed copy. Great. Tell me about kind of your journey from uh, you built a company, you said you had a nine figure uh, exit. Uh, did you have any idea it was going to be that kind of success when you first started? And just tell me a little bit about uh, what that is to kind of go through that journey of building something and then having a successful exit. Well, it, it was my wife's idea uh, in the <laughs> sense that uh, right. uh, she was the brains of the organization. She had a, she's a 4 PhD from the University of Texas in electrical engineering. Mm. And she was a world expert on uh, wide area network performance and, and wide area network management at the time. And uh, so I did believe it was a huge opportunity. Uh, I understood enough as an IT guy and, and engineer, uh, she could explain, simplify it enough for me to understand, hey, yeah, this is an important problem we're going to solve. Uh, networks are only going to get import, more mm. important. This was in, you know, late 90, 1999. Uh, it was obvious that the internet wasn't going to be a passing fad, that it was just going to get more and more important and performance of those networks would be more and more important. So I thought, uh, yeah, I thought it was a huge opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, it turned out to be so. Great. So you've written a book. Uh, what what books are on your, your bookshelf or uh, some that have made an impact on your life that you would recommend to a to a CEO? Yeah. So the, you know, the first book I read that uh, uh, really uh, helped me on the management side, particularly the CEO role is I'd read a lot of business books uh, even before starting some of my businesses and, and, and constantly read during, during that. But a lot of the HR type books, how you deal with people were very touchy feely and didn't appeal to my engineering sense. And, and, you know, Gallup, uh, Marcus Buckingham and Gallup, uh, produced a book, uh, you know, What Great Managers Do Differently was the subtitle. Uh, and uh, it was based on a bunch of research that Gallup had done around management, uh, interviewing uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And, and it really was the first book that put uh, uh, facts and figures around how do you treat people and how can you measure that? and How can you improve the way you handle people? So that was one that was very formative for me uh, in terms of thinking about management of people. Uh, and once you have a way to ma- measure something, obviously it's a lot easier to manage it. Great. What uh, you're kind of in the hotbed of technology in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm sure the uh, your city has changed a lot since you you moved there. Uh, yeah. But uh, tell me a little bit about technology and the importance in, in your your life. Is do you have any particular things that you love uh, that make you more productive? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I am uh, kind of the classic technology early adopter. Uh, uh, so, you know, I've uh, now I'm wearing the latest Apple, you know, watch, which the, the, the version fives are a really great thing. Uh, you know, I've been a big fan of the iPad since, you know, I, I tried it for six months after it launched or something as a huge productivity. I, ju- I just joined the Tesla bandwagon. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much in, enjoying that. That is the future. Uh, no question, at least of part of our transportation. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I stay involved in technology. I, uh, you know, try out a lot of the latest gadgets and stuff and, uh, you know, try to stay aware of what's going on. Great. So outside of work, what do you, what do you enjoy doing? Well, I grew up playing a lot of tennis. I played college tennis. And so, uh, you know, fortunate enough to have a tennis court at my house now. So that's uh, the main source of exercise. Uh, you know, it's very refreshing to, if nothing else, just set set the ball machine on and, and go bang some balls, uh, you know, kind of like a boxer hitting a punching bag. You know, it's it it's, uh, gets you good exercise. And in the Texas weather, you, you work up a sweat pretty quick uh, and can do that pretty much year round. So that's uh, that's the biggest source of exercise for me. You're just rubbing it in. You know that I'm sitting in Minneapolis and we're going to have snow on the ground soon. Or we did actually this last week had some flakes. So, yep. <laughs> yeah. so what, what parting advice would you give uh, a new leader? Yeah. So the, you know, the biggest thing I tell if people ask me, how do you, how do you know if somebody's going to be a good CEO? And, and certainly they, they have to be smart and talented, but that's, that's usually a given, right? The biggest thing that I see is is self awareness. If if they understand how they impact others, 
uh, all, none of us are perfect. All of us have weird things about our personality. Uh, you know, some, uh, if you read my book, you'll, I refer to myself as Eeyore in the book, you know, my natural tendencies to be not the cheerleader, you know, not all. And, and, but, but, but if you understand that you understand how you, that impacts others and you can then compensate for it. Too many uh, CEOs I see run around and think they're, they're, everything's wonderful and all the people love them when in reality, that's not what is happening in their organization. And so if you can develop that self-awareness, develop people that you trust, that'll tell you the unvarnished truth and tell you when you're not actually uh, accomplishing what you think you are, uh, that that's super helpful. And I think if you're smart, then you can adapt and, and do the things necessary to be successful. Great. Well, thanks so much, Joel. This has been a lot of fun. I encourage everybody to go out and get your book and uh, appreciate your, uh, your time and insights. Good to be with you. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.